Chapter One of the Bird's Christmas Carol. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. The Bird's Christmas Carol by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter One: A Little Snowbird. It was very early Christmas morning. And in the stillness of the dawn, with the soft snow falling on the housetops, a little child was born in the bird household. They had intended to name the baby Lucy if it were a girl, but they hadn't expected her on Christmas morning, and a real Christmas baby was not to be lightly named. The whole family agreed in that. They were consulting about it in the nursery. Mister Bird said that he had assisted in naming the three boys, and that he should leave this matter entirely to Missus Bird. Donald wanted the child called Maud after a pretty little curly-haired girl who sat next to him in school. Paul chose Luella, for Luella was the nurse who had been with him during his whole babyhood up to the time of his first trousers, and the name suggested all sorts of comfortable things. Uncle Jack said that the first girl should always be named for her mother, no matter how hideous the name happened to be. Grandma said that she would prefer not to take part in the discussion, and everybody suddenly remembered that Mrs. Bird had thought of naming the baby Lucy for Grandma herself. And while it would be indelicate for her to favor that name, it would be against human nature for her to suggest any other under the circumstances. Hugh, the hitherto baby, if that is a possible term, sat in one corner and said nothing, but felt in some mysterious way that his nose was out of joint. For there was a newer baby now, a possibility he had never taken into consideration, and the first girl too, a still higher development of treason, which made him actually green with jealousy. But it was too profound a subject to be settled then and there on the spot. Besides, Mama had not been asked, and everybody felt it rather absurd, after all, to forestall a decree that was certain to be absolutely wise, just, and perfect. The reason that the subject had been brought up at all so early in the day lay in the fact that Mrs. Bird never allowed her babies to go overnight unnamed. She was a person of so great decision of character that she would have blushed at such a thing. She said that to let blessed babies go dangling and dawdling about without names for months and months was enough to ruin them for life. She also said that if one could not make up one's mind in twenty-four hours, it was a sign that. But I will not repeat the rest, as it might prejudice you against the most charming woman in the world. So Donald took his new velocipede and went out to ride up and down the stone pavement and notch the shins of innocent people as they passed by, while Paul spun his musical top on the front steps. But Hugh refused to leave the scene of action. He seated himself on the top stair in the hall, banged his head against the railing a few times just by way of uncorking the vials of his wrath, and then subsided into gloomy silence. Waiting to declare war if more first girl babies were thrust upon a family already surfeited with that unnecessary article. Meanwhile, dear Mrs. Bird lay in her room, weak but safe and happy, with her sweet girl baby by her side, and the heaven of motherhood opening before her. Nurse was making gruel in the kitchen, and the room was dim and quiet. There was a cheerful open fire in the grate. But though the shutters were closed, the side windows that looked out on the Church of Our Saviour next door were wide open. Suddenly, a sound of music poured out into the bright air and drifted into the chamber. It was the boy choir singing Christmas anthems. Higher and higher rose the clear, fresh voices, full of hope and cheer, as children's voices always are. Fuller and fuller grew the burst of melody as one glad strain fell upon another in joyful harmony. Carol, brothers, carol, carol joyfully, carol the good tidings, carol merrily, and pray a gladsome Christmas for all your fellow men. Carol, brothers, carol, Christmas Day again. One verse followed another, always with the same glad refrain, and pray a gladsome Christmas for all your fellow men. Carol, brothers, carol, Christmas Day again. 
Mrs. Bird thought, as the music floated in upon her gentle sleep, that she had slipped into heaven with her new baby, and that the angels were bidding them welcome. But the tiny bundle by her side stirred a little, and though it was scarcely more than the ruffling of a feather, she awoke, for the mother ear is so close to the heart that it can hear the faintest whisper of a child. She opened her eyes and drew the baby closer. It looked like a rose dipped in milk, she thought, this pink and white blossom of girlhood, or like a pink cherub with its halo of pale yellow hair, finer than floss silk. Carol, brothers, carol, carol joyfully, carol the good tidings, carol merrily. The voices were brimming over with joy. Why, my baby, whispered Mrs. Bird in soft surprise, I had forgotten what day it was. You are a little Christmas child, and we will name you Carol, Mother's little Christmas Carol. What? said Mr. Bird, coming in softly and closing the door behind him. Why, Donald, don't you think Carol is a sweet name for a Christmas baby? It came to me just a moment ago in the singing, as I was lying here half asleep and half awake. I think it is a charming name, dear heart, and that it sounds just like you. And I hope that, being a girl, this baby has some chance of being as lovely as her mother. At which speak from the baby's papa, Mrs. Bird, though she was as weak and tired as she could be, blushed with happiness. And so Carol came by her name. Of course, it was thought foolish by many people, though Uncle Jack declared laughingly that it was very strange if a whole family of birds could not be indulged in a single carol. And Grandma, who adored the child, thought the name much more appropriate than Lucy, but was glad that people would probably think it short for Caroline. Perhaps because she was born in holiday time, Carol was a very happy baby. Of course, she was too tiny to understand the joy of Christmas tide, but people say there is everything in a good beginning, and she may have breathed in unconsciously the fragrance of evergreens and holiday dinners while the peals of sleigh-bells and the laughter of happy children may have fallen upon her baby ears and wakened in them a glad surprise at the merry world she had come to live in. Her cheeks and lips were as red as holly-berries, her hair was for all the world the color of a Christmas candle-flame, her eyes were bright as stars, her laugh like a chime of Christmas bells, and her tiny hands forever outstretched in giving. Such a generous little creature you never saw! A spoonful of bread and milk had always to be taken by Mama or Nurse before Carol could enjoy her supper, and whatever bit of cake or sweetmeat found its way into her pretty fingers, it was straightway broken in half and shared with Donald, Paul, or Hugh. And when they made believe nibble the morsel with affected enjoyment, she would clap her hands and crow with delight. "'Why does she do it?' asked Donald thoughtfully. "'None of us boys ever did.' "'I hardly know,' said Mama, catching her darling to her heart except that she is a little Christmas child, and so she has a tiny share of the blessedest birthday the world ever saw. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Bird's Christmas Carol This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China the Bird's Christmas Carol by Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 2 Drooping Wings It was December, ten years later. Carol had seen nine Christmas trees lighted on her birthdays, one after another. Nine times she had assisted in the holiday festivities of the household, though in her babyhood her share of the gaieties was somewhat limited. For five years, certainly, she had hidden presents for Mama and Papa in their own bureau drawers, and harbored a number of secrets sufficiently large to burst a baby's brain, had it not been for the relief gained by whispering them all to Mama at night when she was in her crib, a proceeding which did not in the least lessen the value of a secret in her innocent mind. For five years she had heard, "'Twas the night before Christmas,' and hung up a scarlet stocking many sizes too large for her, and pinned a sprig of holly on her little white nightgown, to show Santa Claus that she was a truly Christmas child, and dreamed of fur-coated saints and toy-packs and reindeer, and wished everybody a Merry Christmas before it was light in the morning, and lent every one of her new toys to the neighbor's children before noon, and eaten turkey and plum pudding, and gone to bed at night in a trance of happiness at the day's pleasures. Donald was away at college now. Paul and Hugh were great manly fellows, taller than their mother. 
Papa Bird had gray hairs in his whiskers, and Grandma, God bless her, had been four Christmases in heaven. But Christmas in the bird's nest was scarcely as merry now as it used to be in the bygone years. For the little child that once brought such an added blessing to the day lay, month after month, a patient, helpless invalid in the room where she was born. She had never been very strong in body, and it was with a pang of terror her mother and father noticed, soon after she was five years old, that she began to limp ever so slightly, to complain too often of weariness, and to nestle close to her mother, saying, She would rather not go out to play, please. The illness was slight at first, and hope was always stirring in Mrs. Bird's heart. Carol would feel stronger in the summer time, or she would be better when she had spent a year in the country, or she would outgrow it, or they would try a new physician. But by and by it came to be all too sure that no physician save one could make Carol strong again, and that no summer time nor country air, unless it were the everlasting summer time in a heavenly country, could bring back the little girl to health. The cheeks and lips that were once as red as holly berries faded to faint pink. The star-like eyes grew softer, for they often gleamed through tears, and the gay child laugh that had been like a chime of Christmas bells gave place to a smile so lovely, so touching, so tender and patient, that it filled every corner of the house with a gentle radiance that might have come from the face of the Christ-child himself. Love could do nothing, and when we have said that we have said all, for it is stronger than anything else in the whole wide world. Mr. and Mrs. Bird were talking it over one evening when all the children were asleep. A famous physician had visited them that day and told them that some time, it might be in one year, it might be in more, Carol would slip quietly off into heaven whence she came. Dear heart, said Mr. Bird, pacing up and down the library floor, it is no use to shut our eyes to it any longer. Carol will never be well again. It almost seems as if I could not bear it when I think of that loveliest child, doomed to lie there day after day, and what is still more to suffer pain that we are helpless to keep away from her. Merry Christmas, indeed. It gets to be the saddest day in the year to me. And poor Mr. Bird sank into a chair by the table and buried his face in his hands, to keep his wife from seeing the tears that would come, in spite of all his efforts. "'But, Donald, dear,' said sweet Mrs. Bird, with trembling voice, "'Christmas Day may not be so merry with us as it used, but it is very happy, and that is better, and very blessed, and that is better yet. I suffer chiefly for Carol's sake, but I have almost given up being sorrowful for my own. I am too happy in the child, and I see too clearly what she has done for us and for our boys.' "'That's true. Bless her sweet heart,' said Mr. Bird. "'She has been better than a daily sermon in the house ever since she was born, and especially since she was taken ill. Yes. Donald and Paul and Hugh were three strong, willful, boisterous boys, but you seldom see such tenderness, devotion, thought for others, and self-denial in lads of their years. A quarrel or a hot word is almost unknown in this house. Why?' Carol would hear it, and it would distress her, she is so full of love and goodness. The boys study with all their might and main. Why? Partly, at least, because they like to teach Carol and amuse her by telling her what they read. When the seamstress comes, she likes to sew in Miss Carol's room, because there she forgets her own troubles, which heaven knows are sore enough. And as for me, Donald, I am a better woman every day for Carol's sake. I have to be her eyes, ears, feet, hands, her strength, her hope, and she, my own little child, is my example." "'I was wrong, dear heart,' said Mr. Bird, more cheerfully. "'We will try not to repine, but to rejoice instead that we have an angel of the house like Carol.' "'And as for her future,' Mrs. Bird went on, "'I think we need not be over-anxious. "'I feel as if she did not belong altogether to us, "'and when she has done what God sent her for, "'he will take her back to himself. "'And it may not be very long.' "'Here it was poor Mrs. Bird's turn to break down,' and Mr. Bird's turn to comfort her. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Bird's Christmas Carol This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Corrie Samuel The Bird's Christmas Carol by Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 3 The Bird's Nest 
Carol herself knew nothing of motherly tears and fatherly anxieties. She lived on peacefully in the room where she was born. But you would never have known that room, for Mr. Bird had a great deal of money, and though he felt sometimes as if he wanted to throw it all in the ocean, since it could not buy a strong body for his little girl, yet he was glad to make the place she lived in just as beautiful as it could be made. The room had been extended by the building of a large addition that hung out over the garden below, and was so filled with windows that it might have been a conservatory. The ones on the side were thus still nearer the little church of our Saviour than they used to be. Those in front looked out on the beautiful harbour, and those in the back commanded a view of nothing in particular but a little alley. Nevertheless, they were pleasantest of all to Carol, for the Ruggles family lived in the alley, and the nine little, middle-sized, and big Ruggles children were the source of inexhaustible interest. The shutters could all be opened, and Carol could take a real sun-bath in this lovely glass-house, or they could all be closed when the dear head ached or the dear eyes were tired. The carpet was off soft grey, with clusters of green bay and holly leaves. The furniture was of white wood, on which an artist had painted snow scenes and Christmas trees and groups of merry children ringing bells and singing carols. Donald had made a pretty polished shelf and screwed it on to the outside of the footboard, and the boys always kept this full of blooming plants, which they changed from time to time. The headboard, too, had a bracket on either side, where there were pots of maidenhair ferns. Lovebirds and canaries hung in their golden houses in the windows, and they, poor caged things, could hop as far from their wooden perches as Carol could venture from her little white bed. On one side of the room was a bookcase filled with hundreds, yes, I mean it, with hundreds and hundreds of books, books with gay-coloured pictures, books without, books with black and white outline sketches, books with none at all, books with verses, books with stories, books that made children laugh, and some that made them cry, books with words of one syllable for tiny boys and girls, and books with words of fearful length to puzzle wise ones. This was Carol's circulating library. Every Saturday she chose ten books, jotting their names down in a little diary. Into these she slipped cards that said, Please keep this book two weeks and read it. With love, Carol Bird. Then Mrs. Bird stepped into her carriage, and took the ten books to the children's hospital, and brought home ten others that she had left there the fortnight before. This was a source of great happiness, for some of the hospital children that were old enough to print or write, and were strong enough to do it, wrote Carol cunning little letters about the books, and she answered them, and they grew to be friends. It is very funny, but you do not always have to see people to love them. Just think about it, and see if it isn't so. There was a high wainscoting of wood about the room, and on top of this, in a narrow gilt framework, ran a row of illuminated pictures illustrating fairy tales, all in dull blue and gold and scarlet and silver and other lovely colours. From the door to the closet there was the story of The Fair One with Golden Locks. From closet to bookcase ran Puss in Boots. From bookcase to fireplace was Jack the Giant Killer, and on the other side of the room were Hop o' My Thumb, The Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella. Then there was a great closet full of beautiful things to wear, but they were all dressing gowns and slippers and shawls, and there were drawers full of toys and games, but they were such as you could play with on your lap. There were no nine-pins, nor balls, nor bows and arrows, nor bean-bags, nor tennis rackets. But, after all, other children needed those more than Carol Bird, for she was always happy and contented, whatever she had or whatever she lacked. And after the room had been made so lovely for her, on her eighth Christmas she always called herself, in fun, a bird of paradise. On these particular December days she was happier than usual, for Uncle Jack was coming from Europe to spend the holidays. Dear, funny, jolly, loving, wise Uncle Jack, who came every two or three years, and brought so much joy with him that the world looked as black as a thundercloud for a week after he went away again. The mail had brought this letter. London, November 28th, 1880-something. Wish you Merry Christmas, you dearest birdlings in America. 
preen your feathers and stretch the bird's nest a little, if you please, and let Uncle Jack in for the holidays. I am coming with such a trunk of treasures that you'll have to borrow the stockings of Barnum's giant and giantess. I am coming to squeeze a certain little ladybird until she cries for mercy. I am coming to see if I can find a boy to take care of a little black pony I bought lately. It's the strangest thing I ever knew. I've hunted all over Europe and can't find a boy to suit me. I'll tell you why. I've set my heart on finding one with a dimple in his chin, because this pony particularly likes dimples. Hurrah! cried Hugh. Bless my dear dimple, I'll never be ashamed of it again. Please drop a note to the clerk of the weather and have a good rousing snowstorm, say on the twenty second. None of your meek, gentle, nonsensical, shilly shallying snowstorms. Not the sort where the flakes float lazily down from the sky, as if they didn't care whether they ever got here or not, and then melt away as soon as they touch the earth. But a regular business like whizzing, whirring, blurring, cutting snowstorm, warranted to freeze and stay on. I should like rather a large Christmas tree, if it's convenient, not one of those sprigs, five or six feet high, that you used to have three or four years ago, when the birdlings were not fairly feathered out. But a tree of some size. Set it up in the garret if necessary, and then we can cut a hole in the roof if the tree chances to be too high for the room. Tell Bridget to begin to fatten a turkey. Tell her, by the twentieth of December, that turkey must not be able to stand on its legs for fat, and then, on the next three days, she must allow it to recline easily on its side and stuff it to bursting. One ounce of stuffing beforehand is worth a pound afterwards. The pudding must be unusually huge, and darkly, deeply, lugubriously black in colour. It must be stuck so full of plums that the pudding itself will ooze into the pan and not be brought on to the table at all. I expect to be there by the twentieth to manage these little things, remembering it is the early bird that catches the worm, but give you the instructions in case I should be delayed. And Carol must decide on the size of the tree. She knows best she was a Christmas child. And she must plead for the snowstorm. The clerk of the weather may pay some attention to her, and she must look up the boy with the dimple for me. She's likelier to find him than I am this minute. She must advise about the turkey, and Bridget must bring the pudding to her bedside and let her drop every separate plum into it and stir it once for luck, or I'll not eat a single slice. For Carol is the dearest part of Christmas to Uncle Jack, and he'll have none of it without her. She is better than all the turkeys and puddings and apples and spare ribs and wreaths and garlands and mistletoe and stockings and chimneys and sleigh bells in Christendom. She is the very sweetest Christmas carol that was ever written, said, sung, or chanted, and I am coming as fast as ships and railway trains can carry me to tell her so. Carol's joy knew no bounds. Mr. and Mrs. Bird laughed like children and kissed each other for sheer delight, and when the boys heard it, they simply whooped like wild Indians, until the Ruggles family, whose backyard joined their garden, gathered at the door and wondered what was up in the big house. End of chapter three. Chapter four of the Bird's Christmas Carol. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bird's Christmas Carol by Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 4 Birds of a Feather Flock Together Uncle Jack did really come on the twentieth. He was not detained by business, nor did he get left behind nor snowed up, as frequently happens in stories, and in real life, too, I am afraid. The snowstorm came also, and the turkey nearly died a natural and premature death from overeating. Donald came too, Donald with a line of down upon his upper lip, and Greek and Latin on his tongue, and stores of knowledge in his handsome head, and stories, bless me, you couldn't turn over a chip without reminding Donald of something that happened at college. One or the other was always at Carol's bedside, for they fancied her paler than she used to be and they could not bear her out of sight. It was Uncle Jack, though, who sat beside her in the winter twilights. The room was quiet, and almost dark, save for the snow-light outside, and the flickering flame of the fire that danced over the sleeping beauty's face, and touched the fair one's golden locks with ruddier glory. Carol's hand, all too thin and white these latter days, 
lay close clasped in Uncle Jack's, and they talked together quietly of many, many things. "'I want to tell you all about my plans for Christmas this year, Uncle Jack,' said Carol, on the first morning of his visit, "'because it will be the loveliest one I ever had. The boys laugh at me for caring so much about it, but it isn't altogether because it is Christmas, nor because it is my birthday. But long, long ago, when I first began to be ill, I used to think, first thing when I wake on Christmas morning, "'Today is Christ's birthday, and mine.' I did not put the words close together, because that made it seem too bold, but I first thought, Christ's birthday, and then in a minute, softly to myself, and mine. Christ's birthday, and mine. And so I do not quite feel about Christmas as other girls do. Mama says she supposes that ever so many other children have been born on that day. I often wonder where they are, Uncle Jack, and whether it is a dear thought to them, too, or whether I am so much in bed and so often alone that it means more to me. Oh, I do hope that none of them are poor or cold or hungry, and I wish, I wish they were all as happy as I, because they are my little brothers and sisters. Now, Uncle Jack, dear, I am going to try and make somebody happy every single Christmas that I live, and this year it is to be the Ruggleses in the rear." "'That large and interesting brood of children in the little house at the end of the back garden?' "'Yes. Isn't it nice to see so many together? We ought to call them the Ruggles' children, of course. But Donald began talking of them as the Ruggles is in the rear, and Papa and Mama took it up, and now we cannot seem to help it. The house was built for Mr. Carter's coachman, but Mr. Carter lives in Europe, and the gentleman who rents his place doesn't care what happens to it.' and so this poor Irish family came to live there. When they first moved in, I used to sit in my window and watch them play in their back yard. They are so strong and jolly and good-natured. And then one day I had a terrible headache, and Donald asked them if they would please not scream quite so loud, and they explained that they were having a game of circus, but they would change and play deaf and dumb school all the afternoon. Ha, 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 laughed Uncle Jack. What an obliging family, to be sure. Yes, we all thought it very funny, and I smiled at them from the window when I was well enough to be up again. Now Sarah Maud comes to her door when the children come home from school, and if Mamma nods her head, yes, that means Carol is very well. And then you ought to hear the little Ruggleses yell. I believe they try to see how much noise they can make. But if Mamma shakes her head, no, they always play at quiet games. Then one day, Carrie, my pet canary, flew out of her cage, and Peter Ruggles caught her and brought her back, and I had him up here in my room to thank him. Is Peter the oldest? No, Sarah Maud is the oldest. She helps do the washing, and Peter is the next. He is a dressmaker's boy. And which is the pretty little red-haired girl? That's Kitty. And the fat youngster? Baby Larry. And that freckled one? Now, don't laugh. That's Peoria. Carol, you are joking. No, really, Uncle dear. She was born in Peoria. That's all. And the next boy, Oshkosh? No, laughed Carol. The others are Susan and Clement and Ely and Cornelius. How did you ever learn all their names? Well, I have what I call a window school. It is too cold now. But in warm weather I am wheeled out on my little balcony, and the Ruggleses climb up and walk along our garden fence, and sit down on the roof of our carriage house. That brings them quite near, and I read to them and tell them stories. On Thanksgiving Day they came up for a few minutes. It was quite warm at eleven o'clock, and we told each other what we had to be thankful for. But they gave such queer answers that Papa had to run away for fear of laughing, and I couldn't understand them very well. Susan was thankful for trunks, of all things in the world. Cornelius for horse-cars. Kitty for pork-steak. While Clem, who was very quiet, brightened up when I came to him, and said he was thankful for his lame puppy. Wasn't that pretty? It might teach some of us a lesson, mightn't it, little girl? That's what Mamma said. Now I'm going to give this whole Christmas to the Ruggleses, and Uncle Jack, I earned part of the money myself. You, my bird? How? 
Well, you see, it could not be my own on Christmas if Papa gave me all the money, and I thought to really keep Christ's birthday I ought to do something of my very own, and so I talked with Mama. Of course she thought of something lovely. She always does. Mama's head is just brimming over with lovely thoughts, and all I have to do is ask, and out pops the very one I want. This thought was to let her write down, just as I told her, a description of how a little girl lived in her own room three years, and what she did to amuse herself, and she sent it to a magazine and got twenty-five dollars for it. Just think. Well, well, cried Uncle Jack. My little girl, a real author. And what are you going to do with this wonderful own money of yours? I shall give the nine Ruggleses a grand Christmas dinner here in this very room. That will be Papa's contribution, and afterwards a beautiful Christmas tree, fairly blooming with presents. That will be my part, for I have another way of adding to my twenty-five dollars, so that I can buy everything I like. I should like it very much if you would sit at the head of the table, Uncle Jack, for nobody could ever be frightened of you, you dearest, dearest, dearest thing that ever was. Mama is going to help us, but Papa and the boys are going to eat together downstairs for fear of making the little Ruggles as shy. And after we've had a merry time with the tree, we can open my window and all listen together to the music at the evening church service, if it comes before the children go. I have written a letter to the organist and asked him if I might have the two songs I like best. Will you see if it is all right? Bird's Nest, December twenty first, eighteen eighty. Dear Mr. Wilkie, I am the little sick girl who lives next door to the church, and as I seldom go out, the music on practice days and Sundays is one of my greatest pleasures. I want to know if you can let the boys sing Carol Brothers Carol on Christmas night, and if the one who sings My Ain Country so beautifully may please sing that too. I think it is the loveliest song in the world, but it always makes me cry, doesn't it, you? If it isn't too much trouble, I hope they can sing them both quite early, as after ten o'clock I may be asleep. Yours respectfully, Carol Bird. P.S. The reason I like Carol Brothers Carol is because the choir boys sang it eleven years ago, the morning I was born, and put it into Mama's head to call me Carol. She didn't remember then that my other name would be Bird, because she was half asleep and couldn't think of but one thing at a time. Donald says if I had been born on the 4th of July, they would have named me Independence, or if on the 22nd of February, Georgina, or even Cherry, like Cherry and Martin Chuzzlewit. But I like my own name and birthday best. Yours truly, Carol Bird. Uncle Jack thought the letter quite right, and did not even smile at her telling the organist so many family items. The day flew by, as they always fly in holiday time, and it was Christmas Eve before anybody knew it. The family festival was quiet and very pleasant, but quite swallowed up in the grand preparations for next day. Carol and Elfrida, her pretty German nurse, had ransacked books and introduced so many plans and plays and customs and merry-makings from Germany and Holland and England and a dozen other places that you would scarcely have known how or where you were keeping Christmas. The dog and the cat had enjoyed their celebration under Carol's direction. Each had a tiny table with a lighted candle in the center, and a bit of bologna sausage placed very near it, and everybody laughed till the tears stood in their eyes to see Villikins and Dinah struggle to nibble the sausages, and at the same time evade the candle flame. Villikins barked and sniffed and howled in impatience, and after many vain attempts succeeded in dragging off the prize, though he singed his nose in doing it. Dinah, meanwhile, watched him placidly, her delicate nostrils quivering with expectation, and, after all excitement had subsided, walked with dignity to the table, her beautiful gray satin tail sweeping behind her, and calmly putting up one velvet paw, drew the sausage gently down, and walked out of the room without turning a hair, so to speak. Elfrida had scattered handfuls of seeds over the snow in the garden, that the wild birds might have a comfortable breakfast next morning, and had stuffed bundles of dried grasses in the fireplaces, so that the reindeer of Santa Claus could refresh themselves after their long gallops across country. This was really only done for fun, but it pleased Carol. And when, after dinner, the whole family had gone to church to see the Christmas decorations, Carol limped wearily out on her little crutches, 
and with Elfrida's help placed all the family boots in a row in the upper hall. That was to keep their dear ones from quarreling all through the year. There were Papa's stout top boots, Mama's pretty button shoes next, then Uncle Jack's, Donald's, Paul's, and Hugh's, and at the end of the line her own little white worsted slippers. Last and sweetest of all, like the little children in Austria, she put a lighted candle in her window to guide the dear Christ child, lest he should stumble in the dark night as he passed up the deserted street. This done, she dropped into bed, a rather tired but very happy Christmas fairy. End of chapter 4